Welcome back to Le French Rugby Podcast with me, Tim Groves, and ex-Scotland international and adopted Frenchman, Johnny BT. We're going to be joined by a young man rising through the ranks of Toulouse very shortly, but a man at the other end of his career. How are you doing, Johnny? <laughs> what do you mean, other end? Mine is well <laughs> and truly finished, mate. <laughs> Uh, very much at the other spectrum of life, almost compared to our guest that's coming on. No, I'm good, mate. Uh, was up in Paris for, who was I doing the weekend? Lyon against Bordeaux, um, hmm. which was a topsy-turvy game. Um, I was doing that for Premier Sports and Flow Sports, depending where you are in the world. Um, I know it's been good. It's been Mental Health Awareness Week as well, yes. as we're all aware. Loose Heads t-shirt is firmly on. Been checking in with mates and family. Um, I know it's been good, good mate. It's been good, productive. Um, not gonna lie, traveling up and down to Paris is exhausting, and um, but it needs done, but all good. And you, mate, impending doom with the pitter patter of tiny feet, number two, due to arrive not too far away. <laughs> Speaking of mental health week, how are you, Tim? I was gonna say, is this you checking in with mates? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> on a very public platform. Yeah. <laughs> I'm all right. The last. <laughs> does it sound like i'm all right how's your wife how's your wife nobody cares about you that's not what you're gonna say <laughs> exactly i think we're all good we're all good it's a very busy period in the rugby calendar and it's gonna get very busy in this house so you'll be all right we'll open the grandparents you'll be fine absolutely we will chat a bit about those top 14 games including leon bordeaux later on in the show but there's nothing we love more in french rugby than a bit of transfer gossip is there I don't know where you were going. I thought it could have been a scrap. I don't know where you were going, a glass of red wine. Um, (laughs) Mate, there is transfer rumours everywhere. There are so many this week. The most immediate one, despite all the controversy surrounding him at the moment, is Elton Yanchi's heading to Toulon imminently? I don't know, but all I'm hoping is that the nutritionist in Toulon is an overweight Frenchman. That's all I'm saying. Um, Look, I don't know that there's a revolving door and a domino effect going to start fairly soon with standoffs. There's maybe four or five sides, Cast, Stad, Toulon, Breve, a couple of others all looking. Um, Elton's already been over. He played at Poet. It didn't really go that well and he didn't look overly committed, but a new club might be the right fit and a change might be what he needs to sort of reignite his career. So look, clearly a talented player. Um, but I think he just needs to find the, the right fit and the right club over here in France. He's been... Muted has been in contact with a few. I'm not sure if it is Toulon, but there's loads of different clubs looking for 10s. We'll go through them all. Um, and certainly he's one of the more talented boys around. So he'll be snapped up, I would think, um, in the next few weeks. Does all the off-field stuff that is surrounding him at the moment, does that not matter to French clubs? Not as much, I wouldn't say. I think they would more look for pedigree, um, efficiency, what you offer on the field. I think the off-field stuff is more left behind compared to other cultures and other environments. Um, I know I think they know if he can do a job and he can be exceptional for them um, and fire for them they, they would take him absolutely and perhaps filling that Toulon number 10 jersey next season he's announced he's leaving Northampton could Dan Bigger be going there? Mate <laughs> any one of the clubs but it's weird like I mentioned that domino effect but you've got loads of 10s that have come to the end of their careers as well in France all at the same time so recently retired one of my good mates Francois Trandu Cami Lopez who's killing it at Bayonne um, how many more years does he have? Nico Sanchez. So there's lots of places up for grabs um, and big clubs with big budgets. So look, Dan is one of those guys with his drive, his intensity, the way he manages the game for Northampton, Wales, for the Lions. I mean, he would be absolutely phenomenal for a brief, for, a two, for any of them. He, he would be superb. Um, his game has been a lofty standard for a very long time. Um, and he certainly would add value. He's another one, but there's a whole list. We'll go through them all. Um, but yeah, he's been outstanding and, and he would be a great addition to top 14. You mentioned Brief there. We chatted a bit about them last week and the new investment there. They're yeah. after clearly marquee signings. Do you think Bigger could be the one? Well, I think as well as key positions. Um, so they did say they were looking for like a Johnny Wilkinson marquee type. And again, if you're looking at a 10, he would be the type of person that would real add, he would add some bite, some drive, some determination to the way they play and they might just kick them on another level. Like Jeremy Davidson has done an amazing job for such a long time with limited budget. But if you added a bit of a sprinkle of stardust, a few, a few key positions, like a big second row standoff, a center, like they've always had, they've always punched way above their weight, but now with this investment, this not, might be the time that they shift up a gear and instead of avoiding relegation, they click up a gear and aim for the top six again. And like they've been European champions before. Could this be the little thing that, 
makes them click? Absolutely. A little bit more investment, a few key players, and Dan would certainly fit into that category. Come on then, throw some more names out there. What else have you heard? <sighs> Nepo La La La, All Blacks tight head. Again, there's a, a big Charlie Faumina size hole to be left filled at Toulouse, and La 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 would be incredible. Like standing with ABs, his set piece is ridiculous. He's got a big engine as well for a big man, and he's destructive just like Charlie. So we don't know definitely if Charlie Faumina is moving on, but there's one that would be outstanding. Um, Tolafua moving from Toulouse to Toulon again every time he plays he's ridiculous for Toulouse but there's so much competition in that position um, you've also got at Toulon you've got Sergio Parisi moving on end of the year probably moving into coaching staff um, and Tolafua would be the perfect fit I mean great ball carrier always beats a man dominant tackler he's gif you get a decent pay bump going down there as well. So like it all fits, um, but there's loads, mate. And again, it's so early in the season. I get, I have the impression every single year that the transfer gossip heats up and goes quicker every single year. I have no idea why. Marcos Kremer potentially to Clermont. There might be a bit of an exodus at Stade Francais with everything that's going on there. Tristan Tedder, my old mate, I played with at Bayonne, who's been, he's been superb again for Perpignan and the team that hasn't fired um, and keeping them up last year and he started really well this year you've got Cast, Stade Francais, Toulon all looking at him as well he's Gif, he's young uh, soon to be a podcast guest as well he wants to come on and give us his chat at some point too so we'll find look, out lo- we will we'll, we'll get it first we'll find out where he's going um, but like, a great head on his shoulders as well so he'd be a great signing as a 10 as well so Look, there's a little bit of a roller coaster. That domino effect will start as soon as the first one gets signed up. Everything will fall into place. But um, yeah, it's hectic times and good times if you're an agent right now. I'd imagine there's some decent commissions <laughs> being thrown around. Kitchen. And speaking of money and off field matters, they had a thumping win over Perpignan at the weekend, but it's been a big week at Stade Francais. Hans Peter Wilde has been talking in the media again and basically saying he's invested tons of money, they've won nothing. Yeah, it looks like Gonzalo Casada is off at the end of the season, and we spoke about them last week. Lauren Labi and Karim Gazal coming in after the World Cup at Stad. It's just a bit of a circus, um, and it reeks a little bit of almost football management from the top level, which is just a bit shit when we talk about our values and how we communicate and rugby family. Um, like Gonzalo found out he was being replaced when he downloaded his version of Midi Olympique. Really? the rugby paper, um, which is really poor, like on so many levels um, by Wild, And I just, I don't think he understands, like he's not the only guy to have invested lots of money into a rugby club in France and not to have had immediate success. Like that's not how it works here. There's so much in our sport, not just here, that goes into winning rugby games and being good over the course of two, three, four seasons and building to win something. And I just don't think he gets it. I think he's one of those guys that thinks that money should buy instant success um and again football-esque and just the timing that why announce yes they are good coaches they will be great but why announce that now six games in mentally for Casada, he has to coach an entire season wild announced this morning that the arrival of the two, two new coaches would professionalize the club so what it, so what does that mean like imagine you're gonzalo now you've come back from the argentinian camp you've taken that job to save the club as they weren't doing well What message did that send out to him, who's got to look after the squad for the rest of the season, the players that are currently there, the coaches that are there, a recruitment still to be done? It's just super insensitive and wide of the mark, respect-wise. And just poor. Like There's nothing else you can say. I just feel so sorry for him because everybody knows he's a good man. Gonzalo Caseda is a good man, good work ethic, well-liked, well-respected in French rugby, Argentinian rugby. And to be treated like that, it's just not fair. So... I think everybody feels really sorry for him. And also, you just think, what does he do for the next nine months? But credit to him, everyone thinks he will just stick to his guns. He will work hard. He will get the recruitment sorted out with the new coaches. He will play fair and he'll do a decent job. But another person might just down tools. And then the club would be in serious trouble. So they're lucky that they've got him, even though he's been treated like this. Um, But it's just not something you want to see or like seeing in professional rugby. It's horrible. And we do speak about owners quite a lot on here. Is that not something that other coaches will see in terms of the way Hans Peter World is speaking and acting and perhaps not want to go to Stad in future? I think there's an, understa- well, there's an understanding that 
rugby coaching in general is a volatile world. I think probably in France, it's understood it's a little bit more volatile. Um, and that doesn't do anything to dispel that myth, <laughs> I wouldn't say. Um, but it is what it is. It's part and parcel of the game over here. Um, that presidents have power and, and they have the choice uh, and it's his money. He can choose to do what he wants. But that's the difference in the system where you've got other systems run by federations that are union owned, like Scotland, Ireland, where's a little bit more protection, uh, England a little bit less and then France a little bit less again. So look, it's just unfortunate, um, but you want to be part of that party. Like a lot of my mates that are coaches now, you want that to be your reconversion. You want that to be your job and you want to do a good job. It's just that wherever you are in the world, New Zealand, England, France, there's an understanding that two, three, four bad losses and your head's on the block. I think that's global, not just France. And Hans-Peter Wild and Stade Francais have got plenty of cash, as you said. Are they throwing it at Joe Marchant at Quinns? Apparently, another one. But look, they've thrown it before at Heine Kamer and it lasted six months. They've thrown it at different coaching teams. They've thrown it at different players, but for whatever reason, it hasn't quite clicked for them. You want them to get the off-field stuff and the culture and the background set and ready so that people can come in and flourish. But certainly a guy like Joe Marchant, he would be electric if the environment and the setup was right in the top 14 and at Stade Francais for him. Um, he would carve up. And spectacles, what they're looking to create as well, that's what Gonzalo Caseda said from the outset, Racing 92 is the same. When you're competing against so many different things in Paris, you have to throw a little ball around and make it entertaining. And Joe's certainly one of those guys. He's just missed out on the cut again with Eddie Jones's squad, but he would certainly make the cut in top 14. He's a phenomenal athlete and a great rugby player. Um, and the top 14 would be lucky to have him. And it'd be a big statement from him, wouldn't it? Because he's only, I think, 26. He's he missed the cut for the latest training squad, but been involved a lot with England in recent years. Obviously, we're talking after the next World Cup, presumably, but that'd be a, a big move it'd be a huge move but it's almost a la zach mercer and that he could come over here and be phenomenal eddie jones moves on in the world cup and there's a different cycle and he can head back home and try and pip again for his spot on the english side but at the minute he's not getting that look in but his form is very very good and he quite rightly should be rewarded with a different adventure a different experience or a different contract um, and that's certainly what Stade Francais could offer him. So, look, I'd love to see him over here. I think he's a great rugby player, and he's been really unlucky with the, the number of caps that he's had so far. He should have had more. Um, and, yeah, he, he could be a very, very good fit in Paris. Let's get our guest on now, then. And he's a young man with a big future. He's been keeping some big names out of the all-conquering Toulouse team this season. Josh Brennan joins us. How are you doing? Fine, fine. Thanks to yourselves. We're good. And thanks for coming on. Thanks for having we should, me. We should start with... I don't know if you heard, but we had your dad, Trevor, on the podcast last season. So yeah. he was pretty good. Yeah. <laughs> I heard he was good, yeah. <laughs> Mate, the, the other father figure in your life, I know you're exhausted. You're just back from training. Um, but our co-host isn't with us this week. You're still going to be picked so you can speak freely. But what was it like playing with Jerome Kaino? And now as your coach, how's he getting on as a coach? Uh, the funny thing is, actually, I never, I never got to play with Jerome. Uh, the the year, the last year he played, uh, I only played two games, and I didn't get to play with him. But just like training with him as a player and having him as a coach, yeah, it's just like you, you learn a lot. Uh, you learn a lot off him as a player and a lot as a coach too. So yeah, it's great to have him around. Does he hold the tackle backs in training, or is he not too that? big, mate? <laughs> Yeah, so, well, yeah, he used to go hard, at, yeah, but uh, no, yeah, he's he's good as a coach. He's good as a coach. Any gossip you can give us at all? Any story? Oh, you're not going to do this, are you? But it's worth a try. <laughs> <laughs> Wouldn't. Oh, no, there. Yeah. And so, mate, regularly last year, you figured off the bench, but this year, opening game of this season was your first start in the top 14. So how big a breakthrough was that? Like having those bit parts before you mentioned being around your own, but now... And there'll be a big opportunity throughout the year as well. How big has it been the starts you've had this year and the rest of the year to come, which could be absolutely huge? Oh, definitely. It's uh, uh yeah, it's very important. I was really happy just to get a start uh um for the first game of the season also. And it was my first ever start with the first team. So yeah, I was really happy. It just means more game time and uh 
I just I uh, just need to be able to keep it up like just week and week and week out. So you mentioned it's a long season, loads of opportunities, loads of rotation. But in the first five or six games, you've kept out the likes of Richie Arnold, Manny Miafu, Thibaut Flamel, some big names. So obviously that must feel good. But what was said in sort of preseason, were you expecting to be as heavily involved as, as you have been? Uh, I'll, not much was really said. Uh, it was just like uh, came out of the summer prep and uh, this year, well, were four second rows and uh, it was the likes of Thibaut who was also injured in the start of the season. So he missed out on uh, the two two or three first games, uh, I think. And then uh, Richie, Richie uh, got a red card and the week after uh, Manny got the red card. So just like there was always second rows in there, in and out. So that was just like, yeah, had to keep up with it. And to give us a little bit of an insight into growing up and being part of the academy at Toulouse, because it's an academy that produces so much talent and so many players over the years. Some of them leave, some of them stay. But what was it like coming through that system as a youngster? Oh, definitely, of course. It's just, it's like, it's a dream come true when you break into the squad, of course, because you're just, I've been in Toulouse since the age of 12. And I just like, yeah, you wouldn't, you wouldn't imagine when you're young, just, just being there with them first, uh, first team boys. And it's just, it's, it's a massive, it's a massive honor just to to get to play with the first team boys. And you mentioned it there, you're fully ingrained. Twelve is is young to start. People talk about the DNA at Toulouse, the Toulouse way, and I guess for outsiders, it's quite difficult to sort of put your finger on what that is. So give it a go. Give us some insight. What what is the Toulouse way? Oh, it's just uh, it's the Toulouse way is just like playing everywhere. Every everybody like everybody needs to have hands like from one to fi- one to fifteen. That's just the Toulouse way. Like just the French flair, of course. That's uh that's the Toulouse way. But like I think like the past years Toulouse have been playing it great. Uh, and in the way like of course like foreigners have came. Uh, they've just brought their extra to it. So it was just like very good recruits, and they had it. Like from the start, so I think Toulouse, even in the in the way they recruit, they just like they try to find players who already have that DNA like installed in them. So that's it; they bring it to the group. And is that even encouraged into you as a youngster? So you mentioned being twelve years old and the academy being part of that system, but that's obviously Hugo Mola, the seniors, the joueur de Toulousain. As you push passes, you offload, you try and shift the point of contact, make it difficult. But is that something that age 12, 13, 14 is encouraged as well? Oh yeah, they they encourage it when even like even when you're young. Of course, it's it really starts off like when you're 15 and all the game plan. It's uh, it's it. They want they want to copy like uh like the first team boys, and it's also an espoir. It's basically the same. So it's just you're 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 prepared for you're prepared for it. So when you come up, so that's it. Like they really try to install it from a young age. Johnny. This isn't like every rugby club, is it? The first team isn't always so attached because in football, you talk about it quite a lot. Barcelona, like more than a club, there's clearly a philosophy in, a philosophy and it goes right down to the, the juniors. From what Josh is saying, sounds like Toulouse is the same. No, the joined up thinking is awesome. I've never been part of that in any of the clubs really that I've been part of. But I also grew up in clubs where it was almost just trying not to drop the ball. Like it wasn't, you know, push off loads and it was, you know, you're growing up in Glasgow, just keep the ball in two hands, tuck it and try not to knock the ball on. Like that was as simple as it got. But I don't know, I'm not jealous looking back now, but the style they've played, how entertaining they are and the quality of players they've had for 20, 30 years. Like since I've been watching rugby, I remember watching your old man in European Cup rugby when I was little. Like it's ridiculous how they managed to keep that seam and style kind of standard the whole way through with the change of coaches as well. The philosophy sort of stayed the same, which is really impressive. And the fact that they then try and ingrain that and print that onto their younger kids in an academy is just what I would have dreamt of as a kid. Like I wish more clubs and teams and unions would be the same. Like it's absolutely ridiculous. So you're lucky that you're growing up in Toulouse and that you've not been growing up on the West Coast or the East Coast of Ireland. I'm telling you now. <laughs> and Josh, I'm not asking you to give any of them away, but is that joined up thinking at Toulouse? Does that extend even to the fact that you have sort of the same calls in the youth team? Does it go that far? Uh, I would maybe like uh, it would start off in Esport. Uh, maybe you'd have the same calls uh, in uh, like lineouts and maybe like on a couple of trick plays. Yeah. But it just, yeah, I'd say it would change now on the first team. Like, it would be a different, it's just maybe the style of play. You'd still have, like, the same calls maybe for lineouts, but 
that's yeah the trust guess uh, level and we've asked a few people this before but coming from that youth side into lose into the seniors it must be i know that there's joined up thinking but it must still be somewhat daunting when you move into that environment and you've got antoine dupont next to you a bit about him because he's the, the man everyone's talking about in world rugby at the moment how down to earth is he give us a bit of insight take us behind the curtain what's he really like what does he drink does he like a burger like the rest of us is he human He's uh, he's the most down to earth guy uh, I know. He's very very professional too. Now, like you know, he just he uh, just but he's the most down to earth person I know. He he doesn't do much yelling on players. Like he's just he'll 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 like guide you through it if if you're doing something wrong. He's just he's very good to have around. And of course, like he's he's the best player in the world. Like and it's just it is like at first just to see him at training. You're just like this guy. He's just he's so easy even at training. So. It's just, yeah, it's great to have him around and I'm happy to be on his side. So so it's a salad and a sparkling water rather than a Guinness and a burger at Brennan's. So I'm taking from that. Oh, I'd say so, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah so. <laughs> We mentioned earlier, Josh, we had your dad on the podcast last season and he is a proper Toulouse legend. So what has it been like growing up with him to look up to, but also the way he is around the city has it been sort of an added pressure or expectation to follow in his footsteps has it opened doors or you know a bit of both uh, I wouldn't say added pressure it's just uh, very motivating too also like just wanting to get there wanting to be where he was like just just try try my hardest possible to live what moments that he's lived like in Toulouse of course Toulouse gave him everything and here, here we've been in Toulouse now 20 years so it's just like the the love he has for the club. I just want to give as much as he has give he as he has given. So just that, yeah. Well, not much pressure, just more more motivation, of course. Having been sort of in the same situation, having my dad played before me as well, I, I get the same question. And, and for us, like you don't really know any different. People are like, oh, what's it like? You're like, well, it's my dad. Like he's a muppet. Do you know what I mean? Like <laughs> he's to, to you, he's just dad. But to everyone else yeah. externally, he's this Irish superstar and a Toulouse superstar. But he's just your dad. Like more importantly, I, I like to ask, what was he like with you growing up? Like, was he really present or was he? For instance, my dad was totally hands off rugby wise. He was just like, go and live your own life, go and have your own journey. Didn't offer me any technical anything. He was just like, go and speak to your coaches and have fun. It was almost just go and make a group of mates and it sort of evolved. Like, what was Big Trev like? Yeah, no, he was always there just to give me two or three words of advice. And of course, I'd always listen to him, you know. And uh, oh, yeah, that's it. But he was, uh, yeah, he always, he was never like much pressure, pressure. So, and did you get to watch him much back in the day in Toulouse or just on grainy old video VHS footage? Yeah, I was actually like I was young, of course, but like every time I go back to Ireland, uh, like at my granddad's house, he'd have cassettes, you know, of his games. So I just <laughs> wanted to put them, watch the games, but yeah, it was great. It was actually just brilliant to watch, be able to watch the games. Like he has cassettes of all these games, so I think it's a brilliant thing. And what do you make of that old footage? He was um, he was pretty hard, wasn't he, the old man? Yeah, yeah, he was hard. He was hard. Yeah, <laughs> dirty enough, dirty enough, but he was hard. Yeah. <laughs> And I want to ask you about your identity as well, because I'm sort of in a similar situation. Like I've got two boys and a girl, all born in France, but all very much Scottish at home. So we, like yeah. Scottish, British, speak English at home. They've got weird Scottish accents, French group of mates. Their Southwest accent is now ridiculous. You know, like a real mix. So when you look at yourself and your family dynamic, obviously mum and dad are Irish. You're talking about going back to grandparents in Ireland. We have that same connection with Scotland. But for you, how do you see yourself? Because you must have an incredible attachment to both countries through your mates and where you grew up and also through your family and your attachment to Ireland. Oh, definitely. Well, yeah, loads of family in Ireland. And of course, it was always like French, like French out of home. But once I was home, we always spoke English. So it was just like... Of course, the huge attachment to Ireland, and I love, I love every minute I I get to go back, and but I love France too. Like France has given me everything, and I was only a year old when I came over here, so I love France. But uh, yeah, no, I was just attached to both. Both. Johnny mentioned the accent there. If anyone's listening to this and doesn't know your story, they would have no idea that you've spent your entire life <laughs> in France. You, yeah. you sound like. 
you're pure Irish. So uh, kind of how does that work? Is your accent in French quite Irish as well? And do you get stick for your accent in France or not? Or is it completely different? No. No, no. Actually, the French is the French is French, and uh, yeah, the, the English is English. I just yeah, I picked up the accent. So and my daughter is more Glaswegian sounding than I am. I have no idea where it's come from because we live in Southwest France. But then, obviously, the French accent is they go to school with kids in the local area, and they are totally local. They speak flawless French. Their accent is way better than mine, and they come back like now. My eldest is six and a half, and we're doing homework for the first year because he's in CP. And mate, I can't do his homework. <laughs> so like when you ask Josh about his accent, like he'll be as French as a Frenchman. And then he is a Frenchman, essentially. You come over here and you're one, you, you grow up here, you, you're French, you're half and half, but that's it. The nice part and what I'm hoping for my kids, and I hope that you have the same, is that you manage to have the, boast, the, best of, the best of both worlds. So you retain that bit of culture and influence from several countries as opposed to just one, which I think hopefully one day makes you a better rounded individual. Um, but yeah, I'm hoping that's the same for my kids and they can have a great base and circle of mates here, a great strong connection with family as well, but they can identify properly with two countries. That'd be really cool. Yeah, exactly. It's a huge advantage actually just to speak both languages. Like even at club, even in club wise, like, you know, I have, I have all the French boys and also speak to all like the, the foreigners speak English. So it's just a huge advantage. And you have captained France at under 20 level. You've played in all the age group sides. You've been there all your life. Is it 100%? France you're aiming to play for or is there any chance that you could look to play for Ireland in the future having been born in Dublin and obviously having those roots oh definitely if I was given the opportunity to play for France it would be France yeah 100% 100% yeah. yeah just France has given me everything basically I've been here since the age of one so I've got visions in my head because I know that your brother Danny he was offered a contract in Munster right yeah and I've got visions of Trev, like almost out of an episode of Peaky Blinders, like calling a family <laughs> meeting, like, right, everyone in, we're going to talk this through. Are we going to like, so how did you like, did Danny, like, where was the point for him? Was it like, I don't want to go back to Ireland, be away from like immediate family, or I want to try and aim for the French team, or like, was it something as an individual, or is it something you've grown up talking about and laughed about, and now it's actually becoming a reality? Like, how does that all pan out? I'd say, yeah, yeah. Well, that, well, I remember when that happened. Now, Dan was still very young too. Like, he must have been 18 or 19. And, of course, Dan would be the same. Like, he's been in France barely all his, like, all his life, sorry. Basically all his life. So, uh, no, yeah, I think it was a quick decision for him. And then, like, he went on to play, or, like, the under-20s with France. And that was the year they also won the, the World Cup, the under-20s World Cup. So, no, yeah, it was an easy and quick decision for him. But, yeah. And so, Dan had the offer from Munster that Johnny mentioned there have you ever had an offer to go back to Ireland to any of the provinces or have the RFU ever been touched just sort of sounding you out about whether you might be available at some point uh not never actually never never got an offer from Ireland whatsoever oh. you will after this season how long's your contract Josh because now that you're starting games for Toulouse I think you might get a phone call at the end of this year uh, uh I'm actually uh, this is my uh, last season and uh yeah I'm well <laughs> We've done the agent's job. We've put it out there. A phone call now to IRFU. No, of course. Like I'm looking to stay in Toulouse. So just, yeah, that's... that's yeah, but you've got to leverage both sides. Now that we've said that, Uber Moller's <laughs> going to have to bring out the page. The, the checkbook, mate, is going to get bigger. It's good. And you, Josh, you have trained with the senior France side, haven't you, a couple of years ago? Is that right? Uh, yeah, that was... Uh, yeah, they were doing basically things where they were sending on our 20s just to train with them. Uh, yeah, that was... That was a great opportunity, of course, too. That was yeah, a year, year, two years ago. So yeah, they were sending us during uh, during the Six Nations, and yeah, we were training all week with them, and then coming back to club. And uh, no, it was a great opportunity to learn a lot out of that. And how did you find Fabian Gauthier? We speak quite a lot about him on here. Johnny knows him. That whole setup, obviously, it looks very professional. They're doing incredibly well. Your exposure to it at a young age, how did you find it? Oh yeah, it was just next level, of course. Just. Uh, training sessions meetings and all very precise like it's just yeah of course it was next level like from going from under 20s just to train with the 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 France 15 it was just yeah it was next level and uh, the training sessions were really tough like really really tough to have a training session on Wednesday and it's basically like a match so it was yeah tough tough trainings but very very professional very like just very precise on everything hey some coach um going back quickly to your brother to Daniel you're heading down there this weekend, aren't you? So you expecting a warm welcome? Have you played against them before at top level? And how's that going to go? 
Uh, yeah, well, actually, last year twice. Uh, the first game, uh, he was coming off, I was coming in. And uh, no, actually, yeah, the second game, I did play a bit against him. So, no, hopefully I'll get run this weekend and he gets run too. And yeah, hopefully we'll, we'll yeah, be good, like, be good, yeah, we make fun of it. Yeah, just talking about it, of course. Yeah, I, I'd be really excited to play against him. So, yeah. When you did play a few minutes against him, did you get the chance to put one on him or did he put one on you? Or how's the way you look forward to that or not? Yeah, he got the chance to tackle me on the pick and go and all that. You just, you won't stop talking about it, of course. But you know, yeah, that's, that's, hopefully, hopefully, if we get run this weekend, I'll get him back. And going back to this sort of, you're growing up, I don't want to dwell on the, the point too much. Clearly, you, you feel very much French, but with, an Irish heritage and roots that you're very proud of as well. But it is interesting. I don't know what your kids are going to be like, Johnny. We'll maybe come to that afterwards. But who do you support? Do you support France, then Ireland? Do you support them both? Oh, no, France, of course. Yeah, yeah. Well, look, like, I've loaded teammates also who play for France. So, yeah, just, like, really, really, really actually proud and happy to see France win the Six Nations last year. So, it was just... It just shows, like, the progress in the French team. It's just... It's grown so, so fast and so fucking high. Like, it's just brilliant. Who were your rugby heroes growing up? Did you have some Irish, some French, some you take a bit from everywhere? Actually, I was a huge, huge, huge fan of uh, Brian O'Driscoll. I, I actually... thought you were going to say Johnny Beatty then. I was going to say no. <laughs> <laughs> no, mate. Oh, yeah. Actually, higher. I'd love to see uh, you just watch uh, Brian O'Driscoll. Just, I, I would watch clips of him and all. It was just. I don't know, I don't know why, but yeah, I just thought you had everything, like, of course, so just, yeah, I love watching clips of Brian O'Driscoll. And you mentioned it, Johnny, dual heritage, it, it is the best of both of us. Josh can sit here now and be fully French, and it and it's great, and I'm not going to ask you, Josh, if you get to 28 or 29 and, and you haven't been capped by France, then what you do, who knows what happens further down the line. But it's great to have options, isn't it, Johnny? Mate, it is. Uh, and again, it's just the outward look, the sort of, it's really weird, but culturally there's such a big difference between, like, you hop from Ireland to Scotland, over a channel to France. And it's a, it's a different world, but the fact that you can have a foot in both camps and have exposure from different people, different culture, different food. I mean, all these dif different drinks, Guinness, obviously for you guys, but just the different exposure for the different cultures, the different parts of the world, different way of thinking, you're really lucky. Um, and again, that's part of my reason for staying in France is I wanted to give that to my kids, like the way of life, the lifestyle down here, but also what people are like in both countries and family in the mix it's just incredible so mate your dad's done an awesome job and it's really cool to see you boys now kicking on and sort of playing your way through the top 14 like it really is cool and it's an amazing story um and there's not that many people that do it either and the worry about should we move home is it going to be too difficult like you guys are proof in the pudding that it can be done very successfully and everything works out perfectly so mate, no, it's been great and it gives me faith for my family as well that i'm doing the right thing which is really cool and lastly, we've spoken about what it's like to be son of Trevor, the rookie player, but arguably more importantly, what's it been like growing up as the son of Trevor, the owner of the best bar in Toulouse? Is it difficult being an athlete surrounded by all that free Guinness? <laughs> All right, best Irish bar, yes, yes. But, uh, <laughs> no, yeah, I was young enough now when he sold uh, the one that he had in town. And uh, yeah, I do, I, I did, of course, scroll up in the barge and I'll be there. I've, very young like just but yeah great great days I do remember like I was very sad actually when he saw that one but he opened one here in uh, Castage Nest uh, in our village and one in Say so yeah they're working great like he just he loves them so he knows how to run a bar I can still remember playing an away game for Glasgow against Toulouse and Trev pulling me pretty much my first pint of Guinness I think I was 18 and in the bar was like Guinovez like the whole Toulouse team I thought holy shit this is an experience but 100%, like World Cup time or before, we keep getting messages from Brennan Snug and the team on Instagram. They want a live show, so I think we need to set it up and get something done properly during the World Cup and have a proper kick of it in Toulouse, which would be awesome. Definitely, yeah, needs to be done, needs to be done. Well, 100% see you there, Josh. Does he still get you working behind the bar a little bit or not? No, 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 no. <laughs> I used to bit, but no, too, too much training, too much training. Well, there we go. We've signed you up for our first live show at Brennan Snug anyway, so we will see you there. Yeah, no problem. Thanks so much for coming on, Josh, and um, good luck for the rest of the season. You're smashing it already, so um, I'm sure it'll go well. Thanks. Thanks for having me, lads. Pleasure, mate. Catch you soon. Cheers, Josh. See you, lads.
Right, we'll look ahead to this weekend's games in the top 14 shortly, as well as looking back at some of last weekend's action too. But before we do, let's find out what the absolute pick of the week in French rugby was, Johnny, and find out what your meter moment of the week is. It comes from Pro Day Do, mate, and I'm not sure we've had one from Pro Day Do before. And I've uploaded it to our social media channels, so have a look and check it out. But it comes from Massey, away to Carcassonne, and one of the best footballing pieces of skill that I have seen in a very long time. It was almost Zidane-esque. Um, and my old teammate started the whole thing. So Everard Ulai, who plays for the Ivory Coast and is an absolute freak show of an athlete. I'm fairly sure if he wasn't a rugby player, he could be playing in the NFL. Absolute freak show, massive offload. Alexandre Loubière, then a pass goes to the deck, but actually he flicks it up, kicks it, runs it in, offloads to his hooker, and they run in from 50 metres, and it is absolutely ridiculous. So that is the metre moment of the week, a 20-point to 17 win away from home for Massey against Carcassonne, and a ridiculous piece of skill by Alex Loubière for Massey. There we go. That was Johnny's metre moment of the week, and metre is the world's number one wireless meat thermometer, recently making over 20 million cooks better with their game-changing app and completely wireless Bluetooth meat probe. You can use it on a barbecue, in the oven, or in a pan, and you can get your hands on one at meter.com. Plus, you can now get 20% off any full price item. All you have to do is enter the code FRENCHPOD20 at checkout. That's FRENCHPOD20, and you'll get 20% off any full price item at meter.com. You said it there, Johnny. Seven games, seven home wins. Order is restored in the top 14. <laughs> I was going to say, classic. It's going back to 2010. But yeah, it, it, mate, it was bizarre. And there were some really, really big scores. Um, but yeah, I enjoy when teams went away from home. So it's a little bit bizarre to have seven home wins. I don't enjoy it. And I like the volatility and the, the mixing of it up. So I'm hoping that this weekend there'll be a few teams away, went away from home. I'm sure there will. And you were doing Sunday night game. You yep. said last week you thought Bordeaux might edge it away at Leon, but it was always a close yeah. one to call. Mate, they were really good for, I'd say, 40 minutes. They absolutely dominated the first half. Uh, Matthew Jalibert, as, as a team, they just looked more settled, more organised. Still really worrying signs for Xavier Garbajosa and his Leon side. They didn't look settled at all. Like, kept coughing the ball up. Couldn't get past two, three phases. Struggled to get through first phase from strike moves from a lot of the, the, the first half. Um, and the game only really tipped when Bordeaux lost the head. So, Caleb Timu and um, Matthew Jalibar got yellow carded. And that's when there was a little bit of impetus and a change for Leon. Also, guys came off the bench. Baptiste Kuyu, Jordan Tolfua, absolutely monstrous when they came off. They added a real bit of bite. Um, but Leon, again, going to Montpellier this weekend, they won that game. But I just something doesn't look right or it hasn't settled yet. Um, and for Christoph Urios, again, down the wrong end of the table, not where they're used to being. Remy Lam Lamara, my old mate, was playing seven for them the weekend and like battled hard, but it just wasn't wasn't to be. Um, with those two yellow cards, it was just a step too far. And you were right about Casta. They were looking forward to welcoming Montpellier after last year's top yeah. 14 final. Yeah, they were massively. Um, and there was a big ovation as well for Rory Cockett before the game. Um, and yeah, mate, they were hurt at the end of last year. You could see how deflated they all were after the game. I went out with them or didn't even make it out with them, just like a couple of beers in their hotel after the final last year. And that's the one that they had circled in the calendar that they wanted to get right. So um, absolutely a bit between their teeth, dogged, typical cast, ground it out, big defense, big set piece. Um, and they managed to topple Montpellier, who'd been properly effective so far this season. So that was a really, really big win for them. And they'll be delighted to right that wrong from the end of last season. You mentioned a few big margins of victory in the top 14 this week. Yeah. The one that you probably wouldn't have seen coming, 46-10 to lose beating Claremont. I know it's a tough place to go, but... Well, I think as well, you have to, in the same breath, there's also the fact they've lost Roman Intermac. He's still not playing, but up steps Tom Ramos. <sighs> and the guy's just as good at 10 as he's at 15. Um like freakishly good. I don't know how he does it. Um, again, Clermont's another side with John O'Gibbs. There's two or three that, I, that don't look settled yet for me, even though they're sort of a wee bit further down the track with their coaching setup. And Clermont's one of them. They just don't quite look themselves yet compared to what we've seen over the past 10 seasons. But to lose, whether it's Ramos, Capuzzo, Antoine Dupont, like the X-Factor players, key moments, beating 
or getting past one-on-one -on -one situations and just scoring simply like just too good, too much X factor and Clormont couldn't handle them. Um, so yeah, again, worrying signs for Clormont. I've said that before with Benji and they've come good come the end of the year. Um, but again, they just don't quite look themselves for whatever reason. And the other huge margins of victory, Stade Francais and Toulon over Perpignan and Brief. Yeah, so that's a big one for Stade Francais. Again, given the context of what they'd been through this week, um, there's a huge focus on Gonzalo Caseda from the, the Canal Plus cameras and all the TV cameras, which can't have been easy for him. Um, there was also a bit of a grudge because in the last game of last season, um, Perpignan had, because Brieve won away to Stade Francais in the last game of the season, which put Perpignan into the relegation match. And so Perpignan had thrown a lot of shit and a lot of mud after that game, saying that Stade Francais weren't professional. Um, and you had like Makalu came out, who again was incredible this weekend. Once again, came out and said, look, like we'd had enough. We'd been insulted and we really wanted to bury them and run them over. And that's exactly what they did. Like 50 points, um, steamrolled them. And Toulon, absolutely the same with Brieve. Brieve, a red card as well, which didn't make it any easier. The same for Perpignan, um, both the sides taking a red card. And for Toulon, once you've got Cheslin Colby, and again, they're another team that's starting to click a little bit more. With Vizea, who's come down from Stade Francais at 13, who's so dangerous every time he gets the ball. Cheslin Colby on the outside finishing for fun. Um, Toulon are looking better and better, which is positive for them after a really difficult uh, season last year. And speaking of dangerous, a try on his wrestling debut for Christian Wade against Pi. A try on his debut. Another man that's agreed to come on to the podcast at some point. We're looking forward to hearing about his NFL journey. Um, which has got to be one of the rarest stories in rugby. There's not many blokes that A, physically have got the capacity or are the 1% that can do that and then have the mental capacity to, to translate it all as well. So, look, amazing to have him back in rugby. Uh, a great start for him scoring on debut against Poe. Um, and Ra but Racing battled. Like, that was really, really tight until the last 20, 30 minutes. Um, and Poe, who lost heavily last weekend at home to Toulon, went up to Racing and actually gave a really good account of themselves. Um, but Christian Wade, absolutely fascinated to hear his story properly, get to know him a little bit better. Um, and I really hope that he lights it up at Racing because with that deck, with the synthetic, with it being dry every single time they play there, he's certainly one guy with the qualities that he has that could be absolutely amazing. And maybe the best home win of the lot was your old club, Johnny, by on beating La Rochelle. And it looked like a hell of an atmosphere there as well. Do you know what, mate? It was my favourite game of the weekend. Um the manner of it, the stadium, the vibe that comes around this place when Bayonne are on top of their game. Uh, it's again, the micro stories within the story. So they won the game. But what I love about French rugby is European champions, Heineken champions of Europe, who've gone away and won away from home everywhere, come to Bayonne and get made to look absolutely ordinary. That's what I love, is that Bayonne, if you put the, the pay scale and you compare budgets, are nowhere near La Rochelle. And Roman Sazi came out and said, look, we got an absolute hiding in the sheds afterwards from Ogara. We played effectively for nine minutes out of 80, but by on, their line-out was incredible. They picked La Rochelle apart. Their defence was so good to watch. Cami Lopez, a massive point of difference. You speak to Torsten van Jarsveld, the hooker, down there, just the arrival of guys like Max Machino and Cami Lopez running their game, bossing the direction of where they want to play. Cami Lopez's kicking game, pressurizing the opposition, also the cross field kicks, the cheap wins they get and the tries they score. Um, Bayonne are dangerous. And it's been a long time since I've been able to say that, but going there is not going to be easy for anybody. And they're well organized enough to go on the road and win games as well. So I've got a lot of faith now that my old side can stay up. I wouldn't have said that at the start of the year, but seeing what they throw together now, um, really impressed and long may it continue. And in that game, did you see Winnie Antonio congratulating one of his teammates <laughs> at the weekend? Have you ever been Hedge. congratulated like that? Uh, no, I don't think I've been congrat. I think I've I've been I've had headshots like that that have come my way in the past. And if there's <laughs> one man you don't want to get a ball twang from, it is Winnie Antonio. That guy is absolutely massive. Um, no, hilarious though. We shared it on our socials as well. So good. Let's have a very quick look ahead to this weekend's games. Then, what other pick of the bunch, Johnny? Uh, I would say Montpellier Lyon. I would go for a big win for Montpellier. Um, Leon, again, I mentioned, even with those guys coming back, I don't think they've got enough to go to Montpellier. And win Bordeaux Racing, again, looking ominous for Bordeaux, but you back them um, going home to Chaban Delmas to overturn Racing, who looked a little bit flaky last weekend against Poe. La Rochelle Toulon as well. Toulon growing every single game. La Rochelle, who've been chip leader and led from the front with Toulouse the whole way. 
and then we're absolutely humbled at Bayonne this weekend. So uh, th that's a really tough one to pick. But La Rochelle is such a tough place to go to. Um, I don't know, mate. I think Toulon potentially could go there and do a job, which is really weird. Like La Rochelle sold out the last 75 games on the trot. They never lose there. Um, but I don't know. I, I don't know how La Rochelle are going to react. If they start well, they'll, they'll beat Toulon. But if they start poorly and, and Toulon can sense a little bit of blood, um, that could be a big upset. I was going to say more home wins in those ones, but you never know. Toulon could pull off an upset, you reckon? Potential. Potential. Thanks, Johnny. A big thanks to Josh Brennan for joining us as well. And thanks to all you guys for listening. Make sure you hit subscribe. Leave us a nice review if you can as well. Check us out on Rugby Pass and on YouTube. And we'll be back with another episode next week. Au revoir, Johnny. See you, mate. Bye. Bye.